introduce uh, Ken Schwarber. Uh, for those of you who know, uh, Ken actually invented uh, the Scrum methodology, and some of the Google groups have actually started using Scrum internally, and they've been very, they've got very good results with Scrum. And so I thought of, of inviting Ken over here and telling in person everyone what Scrum is. Um, this talk is brought to you by the Agile Grouplet, who actually put posters all around campus advertising this talk. And right after this talk, uh, there are special uh, sessions with Ken, uh, and, and the Agile group is uh, hosting that at around 4 p.m. So if anyone wants to actually join into the uh, Q&A session with Ken later, uh, talk to Mark Schreiber, and he will tell you which room it is in. Do you know what room it is in, Mark? I think it's Avoria, where we have our Scrum meetings with you. Our Avoria in building 45. Oh, 46. 46, I think it is. 46, but check back with Mark if you're interested in a Q&A session. Um, with that, uh, I'll, uh, one more announcement is that this uh, talk is being recorded, and it will be made, made publicly available on Google Video. So if you have any questions of confidential nature, then please uh, hold on till after the talk. Uh, does everybody, yeah, so is everybody OK with that? Great, with that said, I'll pass on to Ken. You don't know if you want to do that. <laughs> you are very polite of you, though. You, you all know that Scrum is not an acronym. It's, it's an event in the game of rugby where like-minded people get together and politely discuss ownership of a ball. <laughs> um, I did not invent Scrum. That's, that would be arrogant beyond belief. So Scrum is is probably a collection of best ideas of what a number of people in our profession have come up with over the years. Um, the urgency of it and agile and extreme programming came with the ascendancy of methodologies and process gurus and project management organizations and um, waterfall and so it, it's more of a coalition of those ideas in reaction to that. Um, there, there were two Japanese gentlemen, Nanaka and Takauchi, who published a, an article, the new new, public, new new Product Development Game in the Harvard Business Review in 86, and later a book called The Knowledge Creating Company in 1988. And in it, they described an approach that embodies a lot of the ideas in Scrum. They, they had studied companies that were in tight competitive situations. That is, they were losing money and, um, and certain products. And this included, um, included Fujifilm, Toyota, 3M, and Xerox. And all these companies that they had studied had come up with competitive responses to um, the encroachment on their market share using a very similar approach. All of these companies, um, tried to look and see what the competition was, what the threat was as clearly as possible. And then they pulled together a team of their very best people. And it wasn't just, you know, the engineers or just wasn't marketing people. Instead, it was a cross-functional team. And they wanted this team to come up with a competitive response for their company. And the reason they chose a cross-functional team, people who knew their company from all different angles, is they didn't want to come up with a great financial solution that was absolutely useless from a support point of view. They didn't want to come up with a great engineering solution that couldn't be, wasn't of any value in the marketplace. So they wanted something that was of value overall within the company. So they got someone from finance, and they got someone from marketing, someone from sales, someone from support, yes, even someone from support, who'd have guessed that, someone from engineering, research and development, um, inventory management, and they got them together and said, as you guys know, by the way, guys is appropriate in here, but it's not meant to be pejorative, okay? Um, guys, we have a horrible situation, and we are counting on you to save our bacon. We're counting on you to rescue our company from the corner that we're backed into. So we want you to come up with a competitive response to what that other company is doing. 
Um, by the way, you don't have forever, uh, we're in a bit of a financial crunch here, so you have three months. And, and so what we'd like you to do is, is go to this facility we've rented for you across town, and we want you to come up with the response that we are going to introduce to the marketplace to regain our market share. Oh, by the way, in three months, we don't want from you a position paper. We don't want a PowerPoint presentation. We don't want a discussion. We want the product ready. We want it ready to be shipped. You know, we're not going to review what you've done. You're our best people. Why would we have to approve or disapprove? So simply do it. By the way, um, during the three months that you're in this facility across town, we're not going to bother you because it's amazing, you're actually working on something that is of great importance to the company. So we're not gonna interrupt you. However, if you're doing anything at all that needs external help, needs resources that you don't have, needs support that you can't get, again, since you're working on something that's really critical to the company, come to us and ask for it. And then they took them outside to a bus that took them across town, and at first, the people on the team, it was like eight or nine people, were like concerned that maybe this was a new form of layoff that they hadn't been <laughs> made aware of. And then they settled back and they were, you know, pretty happy to be with each other and, you know, how's your wife and my kids are in school and, you know, they're talking about the... And also one of them is like, hey guys, you know, we have two months and 27 days left. Now, if we don't come up with something really good, one, we're going to be letting our company down because we were sent here to, to regain market share. The second thing is we are going to be utterly humiliated in two months, 27 days when we stand up and say, well, um, we couldn't think of anything. You know, that's kind of a bad situation to be in. Now, of these situations that were studied, not one of those teams failed to come up with something that had a significant impact on the marketplace. Some of them were, you know, stellar, some of them were okay, but none of them were situations where they were like, well, you know, we didn't need another month, couldn't quite get it done. You know, they all came up with something that was a competitive response. All of the aspects that are in Scrum, the key ones, are in there. They were in a time box. Everything in Scrum is a time box. And that's so things don't go on forever. Well, you know, we could think up the design, but we need another, you know, while more come back. So everything is a time box. Everything is done with cross-functional teams that are responsible for managing themselves. Kind of an interesting concept. It, it's borrowed from lean thinking and just from observing people that the people who can best figure out how to do the work are the people who are doing the work themselves. It's done with a constrained size of a team. So you don't get more than eight or nine people. Matter of fact, the smaller, if you have three or four people, that's really neat, but you still need the cross functionality. It's a team that has to have something that is done at the end of the time box. There is no such time box as one that comes up with something that has something which is an abstraction that's only known to the people who built it, like uh, an object model or a sequence diagram. That's not done. That's an internal artifact that's work in process. So in Scrum, at the end of every time box, you have to have the team have something that's done and can potentially be shipped. So you see all the aspects of, of Scrum there. Jeff Sutherland and myself, who pulled Scrum together from a lot of these ideas, um, both of us were managing software companies. This was in the 90, 91, before some of you were born. Um, and, and we had read about Scrum, and we both had products where the customers wanted large numbers of changes. We had a large code base that we had to maintain and sustain. Um, and we had a lot of competition you know, affecting us. The only reason we were able to come up with Scrum with that fit all these characteristics, though, was we were both developing software using Smalltalk. And Smalltalk was the first, I think Lisp might be the other one, the first integrated development environment where you could rapidly build and deploy and even test, test, test product. So 
that was the instantiation of Scrum. And Jeff and I used it ourselves and, and we used it with some of our customers later. It by and large went nowhere. We used it competitively to help a number of companies. But it wasn't until you started seeing a number of other good IDEs, so think of Eclipse and things like that now, that you start seeing it pick up in the marketplace. So it's an idea that if we didn't have the technology, would have gone nowhere. Now at the same time that we're building Scrum, which is a management process for managing product development, Kent Beck, Ron Jeffries, Ward Cunningham were engineers in a small talk environment and they came up with extreme programming which are a set of engineering practices that work in that same type of environment. So we use Scrum to manage product development and extreme programming practices are often used and, ex and extensions of them um, to help the engineers build and come up with engineering disciplines that fit um, to support and work with a scrum type of environment. So the two are, are hand in glove, mutually compatible, things like that. Scrum isn't a methodology. If you, if you have a methodology and you've got a, a problem, a question of how to do something, you know, you can go to the methodology and you can turn to whatever page, like page 77.6, and there's the answer on how to do it. Pretty good. Scrum is, is much more like a, a small baby process or like a framework. It's really, really simple. So, so think of the game of chess. It's simple. It doesn't have a lot of rules. I mean, you know, I, I've got a knight, 2-1, one, 1-2, one, can't land on a player of its own color. There's not a lot more to it and a bunch of rules like that. And yet you can find incredibly detailed, complex strategies and tactics about how to build, um, how about how to play chess. Because every situation gives a rise to different types of circumstances and different types of thinking. People can study it, people can think about it, but how they execute it, how they play it, is up to their own intelligence, skill set, whether they've been drinking, you know, all those types of characteristics. And Scrum is very much the same way. It is so trivial, I, I sometimes wonder what the big deal is, except that it frees us from the belief that someone else can tell us what to do in every circumstance and that it'll work. Scrum's assumption is that you are intelligent, or at least as intelligent as you'll ever be, and that you will use that intelligence and your experience to come up with the best solution for whatever circumstance you're in right then. When we first came up with um, announced Agile 2001, there were, there were a number of comments that um, Agile was really, really good. This was from Barry Bame and people like that who were kind of a little troubled by Agile. And they said, really, really good. If you have a team of outstanding engineers that are using excellent engineering tools, have engineering practices down pat, understand the business domain, the technology domain, inside out, um, and aren't interrupted and have all the resources they need, then you can use Scrum. Well, it's true that people like that can build an increment of software every iteration. That's good. However, Scrum works with idiots. You can take a group of idiots that maybe even didn't go to school, don't understand computer science, don't understand software engineering techniques, hate each other, don't understand the business domain, have lousy engineering tools, and uniformly they will produce crap every increment. <laughs> this is good. You want to know at the end of every iteration where you are. And part of the point of Scrum, and this has nothing to do with sardines, oxygen, and all the rest of that, that came afterwards, it borrowed this from Scrum, um, is transparency. So that everyone knows where you are all the time. So one of the intentions of, you know, like these, those people we sent off site for three months to build something, is we want to know where we were at the end of that time box. So at the end of every Scrum sprint, which is its iteration's name, 
we want to know exactly where we are. So we asked the team to have something done in the sense that it could be sent out to the marketplace. Really done. And to the extent that those are good engineers with good engineering skills and da 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 all the rest of that, they'll have something pretty good done. To the extent that they have trouble tying their shoes, they're not going to have much done at all. And you know that right up front. So I'm at a, um, I get asked really interesting questions. Like, what do you do for a living? <laughs> um, I'm at a bank, and they're replacing the trust system. Big system, right? And they're going to put in a new trust system that they bought. And they're going to use a new set of software to build the user interface to it. And it has 28 feeds to existing legacy systems. Of course, none of which have testing harnesses around them. So if you modify any of the data or you get referential data problems, you don't know it until a customer complains that they've lost their account. So they want to ask how Scrum would fit in with this. And one, their very last question, this was an hour, right? I love these conversations. This was an hour. And their last question is, should we use Scrum? And this is a $30 million uh, I think it was a 17-month project, and I, I advised them absolutely, definitely not to use Scrum. And of course, that's not what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to sell it, you know, all that, that sort of stuff. I said, well, why is it inappropriate? I said, this project, this doesn't stand a snowball's chance in hell. <laughs> this, is, this is the thing that kills careers, turns people into, into alcoholics, has people fleeing down the street, gets women leaving our profession left and right. If you use the, the other version of Waterfall, if you use that, by the 13th, 14th month, you'll get a good sense of how bad this project is going. <laughs> and you're going to be able to then start laying in place all the plausible deniability, you know, new career paths, other people to blame other than yourselves, and that will give you time to do it. I said, if you use Scrum, you're going to know what sort of deep trouble you're in right after one month. And there's going to be nowhere to go because <laughs> <laughs> everyone's going to be saying, you convinced us to do this project and this is all you can build in a month? Let's see, 1 17th of the total budget we gave you, we should have had more than this. And so, you know, it's going to be very transparent that the project is a non-starter. And that's the sort of thing that the transparency that Scrum makes open. Let me draw a picture of Scrum. It's, it's real complex. There's a list of work to be done. And this list is prioritized, just like you know our to-do list around the house over the weekend. So it's prioritized to the stuff that's of most important, or maybe the stuff of highest value, or maybe the stuff that's of the greatest risk that we want to make sure we can get out of the way first, is at the top of the list. The stuff that is probably not very important, or we actually don't care if we don't get to, is toward the bottom of this, but we have it there to prove to our family that we actually were listening to them and we heard it. Okay, this list is used as fodder, as inventory for starting iterations. Every iteration or sprint, a team, cross-functional team of people with all the skills needed to build something that's done for that product set. Get together with the person who is representing the customer, and they say, so what, what's the highest priority stuff you have next? And the person goes, uh, it's this stuff. They say, okay, so we think we can do about this much of it over the next iteration or sprint. Now, normal sprint I like is about 30 days with a good solid team. If I get worried that the team is having trouble, I shorten it to two weeks so they can't go too tight, too far out of balance. But it's always the same length. So the team says, well, you, you said you'd like to have this much done. We, this is all we think we can do over the next sprint. Do being the operative word there. Do means change it from a requirement of what's needed in a product to something that's done and is ready to be used in that product. QA, 
documentation, refactored, meet standards, all of those good engineering practices. Then the team goes off and they have this whole period with minimal interruptions. The moment you start interrupting them, they start, you know, it's like letting air out of a balloon. You all know this. So they have this period to create it and at the end of the period, they show the customers what they did. And again, the word done is critical there because they can't show them something, oh, we got a lot of it done, but we weren't able to test it. That's not done. Oh, we got a lot of it done, but there's no documentation. That's not done. Oh, we got a lot of it done, but it doesn't meet the standards because we didn't have time. That's not done. So it places a lot of pressure on them to exercise their profession competently. If it's not done, customer doesn't take it. So the customer looks and sees what they've done, and based on what they've done, then reprioritizes this list so that it now reflects what are the next highest priority things to do, meets again with the team and says, okay, so this is now the highest priority things to do, and the team then selects what to do next and goes off and builds it for the next 30 days. So if I were setting a goal like to ruin our, my competition's day, and I started here, the way I might go with this list is like this, honing in on it, as the competition does different things, as I find different technologies, does different things, as I find different opportunities. So month by month, I'm gonna hone in on my target. And that's all there is to Scrum. And a few rules. Like one of the rules is that, and this is called an inspector adapt loop. It's called a feedback loop. It's a way of dealing with complexity, frequent changes in environments. Inspect what the team's been able to do and adapt. One of the adaptations, for instance, at that bank might be, <laughs> you guys are fired. Um, another adaptation might be, you guys are wonderful. Where can I find more of you? Another might be, based on what you did, I see an opportunity to do this and this and this next. So it's where you get collaboration between marketing and customers and prospects and engineers on what is the most valuable thing they can do next. But you need to actually have something that's done to have that. One of the things we don't allow in this, in this review are PowerPoints of what it might look like if it were done. We don't allow um, prototypes of what it might be if it were done. Instead, we want to know where we really are transparency. The other type of meeting that happens in this is every day we ask the team to get together and make transparent to each other where they are. Hi, I'm, I said I'd do these things during the sprint, during the iteration. This is what I did do and this is what I didn't do. Hi, this is what I did, this is what I didn't do, this is what I'm going to do next. So it's a synchronization of the engineers, the developers on the team on a daily basis. And that's again transparency. I remember um, I was in one of those meetings and this word done again haunts the meeting because if you say in the meeting, well I did this yesterday and I'm gonna do this today, um, there should be some meaning to that. So I'm in a meeting with a bunch of engineers and one person says, well, I did this yesterday and I'm going to do this today. And sarcasm is a great leveler. And I listened to one of the QA people said, fat chance. I said, what did you say? So I said, fat chance. So what do you mean fat chance? She said, Our definition of done is that it is coded to standards, it's been reviewed, it's been um, documented, we have documentation in it, it has a unit test built to it, and it's been checked in and successfully built. He has not checked in his code. Whoa! You see a little conflict in the team. You know, like he's going to go out and slash her tires for that sort of thing. And I'm like, so, so why, why uh, have you checked your stuff in? So, oh, well, he said, I normally do, you know, but we're in a 30-day sprint, and, and I'm in an area of the code that everyone's working on. And, and, you know, 
if I had to check in every day, I'd have to be reconciling my changes to everyone else's changes on a daily basis. So I'm going to wait till the 22nd, 23rd day, then I'll check it all in. And the rest of the team is like. <laughs> so, so Scrum has a lot of good, neat things like good news every day, good news at the end of every iteration, at the end of every sprint. But it's also got some really rotten things, like on a daily basis finding out that the person you were counting on didn't get done the work that they were expected to do. Like finding out that they have no intention because they think that person is a rat. You know, personal conflict. You get that exposed every day. At the end of every sprint, finding out that the team is not progressing as marketing had hoped. So how many of you are familiar with Scrum? Okay, so you know what a burn down is. It's standard way of tracking progress. If I take this list of work that a customer wants in a release, in something we're going to put out, and I put it on a horizontal axis and estimate it for the amount of work it represents. And I take the team's ability to transform it into something that's shippable across every sprint. And I track this month by month by month by month by month. That gives me a burn down. And if I take the trend line for that burn down, I can pretty effectively predict as the trend line starts settling in when that will be ready. That's good. That's also potentially terrible. <laughs> Traditionally, a project starts and you don't know where it is till close to the end. Here, after one month, two months, three months, you know where the project is going, where the release is heading. If it's heading this way, There's a problem. There's a big problem. At um, your neighbor down the road, Yahoo, your friendly neighbor, Yahoo, they, they use Scrum. They have one person on each release that's responsible for making intelligent decisions about how to invest money for every release. And this person is responsible for, at the end of every sprint, looking at where they are compared to where they want to be and making decisions. This person is called the single ringable neck, <laughs> right? So in, in some releases, you know, it doesn't go quite the way it expected. And so everyone's like disheartened and upset. If a release doesn't go the way you anticipate that it's going to happen with the functionality of highest value by a date when everyone knows it'll be ready, that's the person you come to. That's the person who at the end of the second sprint should have said, oh, geez, we're not going to be ready on the date that we expect. And because of that, we're going to have to invest more money in this release than we had anticipated. Because of that, the return on investment is going to be lower than we anticipated. Because of that, someone else is going to get some new functionality out before us. Oh my god, what do we do? And for rate making that visible. One of the really great things about Scrum is it gets all of the news visible, whether it's good or bad. It doesn't consider that there's good or bad news. It just considers that there's news and that intelligent people will want that news so they can do the most beneficial thing for the entire organization. Now that's a test of the character of an organization. Of the organizations that are attempting to implement Scrum, probably 30, 35 percent will successfully implement it. And that's because of this core problem. Most organizations don't want to be faced with something that they don't want to see. And this puts it up there and says, are you going to do something about it or not? How, how many of you um, like working for Google? 
how many of you view it as a special place? It's good. It's very good. If you are, can, in the back room, can you see this? Okay, if you are on a velocity that's going to give you a date of this, and your marketing department, your product management department has told the world that it's going to be released on that date, that's awkward news. Now, traditionally, what happens when that news is faced is marketing, product management asks you to increase your velocity. Right? The assumption being that you normally sit at a very comfortable table with your feet up drinking beer, bullshitting with the guys, and all they have to do is say, work a little harder, you take your feet down, you start working. This is reasonable, right? Normal thing. And the reason they know that's true is all they have to do is ask you to do it, and my God, your velocity does increase. And, and kind of if you give any of that whiny crap about, you know, you're doing it as best you can and this is going to undercut quality and stuff like that, all they have to do is actually go to your boss or your boss's boss and say you're not on board, you're not really part of the plan and you're not part of the program and you're not all these things. And, and then, you know, gee, it wasn't even worthwhile you saying it because now suddenly you're visible as a bearer of bad news who wasn't on board. But you still have to do it, right? There's no way out. We have time-honored traditions in our profession for increasing our velocity under pressure. One of them is we drop quality. We do that by not following standards. We can stop documenting codes. We can, when we have more stuff to apply to an area, we can not refactor it and correct the design the way it should be, instead just plastered on top of it, knowing that it's not the right thing, but somehow we'll get back to it. Um, so we have all those techniques. We can also not build unit tests. We cannot put all the automated tests in for acceptance tests. That's all okay. We can work long hours. That's okay. Um, it's a, about every game company in the world now uses Scrum. And one of the reasons was High Moon Studios came out with a killer release using Scrum that um, they got out before time with much better quality than expected. They are owned, they were owned by Sammy Sega, a Japanese company. And the CTO came back and said, we're going to use Scrum, this is the right thing. Part of it is sustainable pace. You know, you send these people off site for three months to work on a problem, and they work on the problem like eight or nine hours a day and they're thinking about it. When they get in their car, their motorcycle, their bike, whatever, to go home, the problem's still rolling around their head. When they're t scratching their cat's stomach, playing with their dog, whatever, the problem's still going on. When they're sleeping, the problem's still going on. So if I work them 12, 14 hours a day, that problem gets worked less effectively. The design, the way they implement it gets less good. The way they write the code becomes less effective. So they're writing eight or nine hours a day, sustainable pace, and the Japanese management says, and apparently in Japan they work long hours, it's a mark of um, being part of the organization, said you have to work 12, 14 hour days, otherwise you're not really buying in. Say so one up to 12, 14 hours, hour days, and they found that the defects increased 60%. And the cost of correcting those defects more than offset the additional functionality that they were building. So they dropped back down to eight or nine hours. Sammy Sega Management drove by at night, and they're looking at the buildings, and the buildings are dark, and the parking lots are empty. These people, these people are not good people. So they sold the company to management, a management buyout, because they, they culturally couldn't stand them. Two months later, management released the product, sold it to a producer for twice the cost of the bio. 
which of course caused a huge spread of information throughout the game industry and every now adopted scrum. The idea is that one of the ways to increase velocity is not by working longer hours. All that does is create, produce more crap. But that's one of our time-honored traditions. So we use all those approaches and we produce more crap. Good. Okay, this, this is um, interesting, but so what, right? That's our profession, that's our fate in life. Unfortunately, as I've been helping organizations implement Scrum, I've ran into, run into a very common problem with every organization. Now the reason I'm mentioning this to you is so that you can think about it. Of course that is not happening here, okay? And you should be listening to this problem to make sure it doesn't happen here. What these organizations have as a problem is something called core or infrastructure software. And in this burn down chart, they can build new functionality on the fly. They are really good developers. That's the burn down. Unfortunately, all this new functionality has to link into this infrastructure of software to really make effect. You know, so the infrastructure is the core processing where everything really happens. The problem they've got is the velocity of the core software is up like this. So if you want to, if it takes you to build one piece of new functionality, it takes one of these, it's gonna take you 20 times longer than, than you thought because your throughput is throttled by that core functionality. And this is bad news. So I looked into where core functionality came from because most organizations seem to have it, including many of your competitors. And it all seemed to have three characteristics. The first was that it was fragile. If I changed one thing in that core piece of functionality, it tended to break other things. Pretty bad. The second characteristic of the core software, the infrastructure software, was it didn't have good test harnesses around it, good automated test harnesses around it. So that if you went in and you broke something, you tended not to know about it until it was up on all the servers and then your customers would let you know about it. That's not good. The third thing that was characteristic is there were only a few suckers left in the entire company who still knew how to and were willing to work on the infrastructure. Everyone else had fled to newer stuff that was easier to use and easier to build. And then all those reasons, reasons why the core functionality has a much, much lower velocity. I remember one, one company that's a competitor of yours has about 120 engineers, developers of all kinds, of whom 10 are still able to work on the core functionality. The other 110 are working on new stuff. Okay, so you can imagine the problem with that. If this is the burn down for the new stuff, but this is the throttle on it, how do they get the new stuff out? Because it's really constrained by the core functionality. And we were having a hard time with them understanding that until we just started one sprint in sprint planning meeting, and we brought all the engineers into the room. We said, okay, so of the stuff you wanna do during the next month, what's the highest priority, second highest priority, third highest priority, fourth, and we just listed eight or nine items that were in priority order. We said, okay, the product manager for the first area and the lead engineer for the first area, come on up here. Now select the people you need to do this work over the next month, including, of course, the core engineers. And they did. We said, okay, now leave. Get out of here. Start working. And we did that with the second team, the third team, the fourth team. And we got to the fifth product manager and the lead engineer. And he said, we can't do anything. There's no core engineers, the DBA people, the people who change the user interface part, that we need to make these our new functionality. So we can't do anything. 
Okay, so we looked around the room and there were 60 engineers left. They were thoroughly constrained by the core piece of functionality. So I, I've looked at this problem. We come up with engineering workarounds. If you have enough money, you rebuild your core. If you don't have enough money and your competition's breathing down your neck, you shift into another market or you sell your company. <laughs> <laughs> Venture capitalists are into this now, buying dead companies. It's called design dead software. But, but I was always troubled on where did this core software come from? I mean, did they buy it? I mean, did someone, you know, pull, hoodwink them, pull the wool over their eyes? How come they bought this core software? You know, that was the dumbest thing I could ever seen. And then I started thinking about, about it and checking this out at a couple of companies. And what I saw was, here is, let's say, one of your products. Certainly not here. And you've got a velocity of 20. But your product people, your marketing people, need some more functionality. They just need it. Okay, they've got to have it. And so that's going to require, because that's more stuff, that's going to require that you have a velocity of 22 to do it. Well, geez, I mean, what, what are you, how are you going to get a velocity of 22? Are you going to be smarter when you wake up? That's probably not going to do it. Are you going to put in new engineering tools? Are you going to work? But no, none of that will work. So what you actually do to get the increased velocity is, of course, cut quality. Because if you remove quality, you can do more crap, right? So you get a velocity of that. Now, if you do this, and, and that release goes out on time, some grumbles from the customers, you know, whatever, but customers always grumble. And the product manager is promoted, becomes, you know, drives a new BMW, parks in one of the fancy spots, and all those things happen. So what happens is release by release, um, so what happens, they get a, really, a velocity of 22. The next release that you start, because you're working from a slightly worse code base with clever tricks in it, unrefactored code, no tests, um, the best velocity you can really do is 18. Well, that's no good, and no one's going to get promoted on that, so the product management people come down to you and say, guys, you just got to do it. So you cut quality again, but this time when you cut quality, the best you can do is 20, because you're starting from a worse code base. Now, it takes about five years, release by release, <laughs> for you, right here, to build your own design dead product. You don't have to buy it, you can build it yourself. <laughs> and don't forget as you do it and put yourself into a competitive corner, this is in a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, to leave behind someone else who has to fix that. <laughs> because it's horrible. And I'm not sure about your core code base, but this is um, a real problem in our profession. And it's the core of our difficulty in implementing Scrum. It's got two aspects to it. One is, when we are told to do more, we cut quality without telling a soul. It's just second nature. I have trained over 5,500 people and put them through an exercise like this, more very subtle, very sneaky, where Push comes to shove, they have a choice of saying, well, we can't do it, or saying, we'll do it, and cutting quality. Only 120 of the 5,500 have said no. All of the others have just cut quality automatically. It is in our bones. Muscle memory. The other part of this habit is the product management. Them believing in magic that all they have to do is tell us to do something, and this is you know, what the illusion we support by cutting quality, it'll get done. And these are good, what's called good short-term tactics. These are horrible long-term strategies because it's back your company into a corner strategy. 
Now, I'm not sure if this is true of your product management. Um, they produce MRDs and PRDs, things like that. It turns out that their real option isn't necessarily pressuring you to do more with less quality, but instead to change what they actually put in the release. Remember we said they have a product backlog that's prioritized? They can only put in the stuff that's of real high value and then stop putting stuff into the release and ship it. One of the industry statistics is that over 65% of all functionality that is delivered and then has to be maintained and sustained is rarely or never used. So this pushes, if moment you say no to dropping quality, it then puts the onus on product management to then think about given the velocity, given the time, given the marketplace, what can I do that optimizes our marketplace impact within that rather than just coming up with a laundry list? These are big changes and it all comes out of doing stuff iteratively, incrementally, self-managing team with transparency. You will have, if you use Scrum, someone on each team whose name is called, it's called the Scrum Master, also known as the Prick. <laughs> and this person's job is to make sure that you don't cut quality. Darn. And they have no authority but they, what they can do is if we've defined that an increment has a certain level of quality for it to be demonstrated to our product management, their job is to make sure that quality is there. And if the quality isn't, not to let you demonstrate it, but instead to say to the product manager, we lost our heads, we're not done. It's going to take us another month to finish this and let it bubble up that way. This person is probably the least loved person in the world because they stand right at the nexus between product management believing that any amount of stuff can be done and our willingness to cut quality to help them support that belief. The burnout rate on these people is usually like 13, 14 months. <laughs> throw them away. <laughs> we often get them from hopeless professional areas like QA. <laughs> People in QA are used to doing incredible things with no authority, no respect, and no hope of success. So that's where we take these people. <laughs> I could talk forever, but I'm getting a little hot. Um, what questions can I answer for you about Scrum, about Agile, about the way it's going in the marketplace, about its impact on your career paths, about its impact on your functional areas, things like that? Yes? Um, This guy is keeping heresy. He said that you get a PRD and there are often during the release changes to it. How can that be? 35% <laughs> of all pro requirements change during the average project. I'll tell you where this comes from. This, this comes out of waterfall, 25 years of waterfall, okay? where you're the marketing department, the product management department, the customer, and we're engineering. And we're going to take whatever you tell us to do and we're going to lay out an architecture for it, an infrastructure, detailed design. We're going to actually write code and you know, all that stuff. And if you change your mind and we're down here, it's going to have a huge impact. The, the statistic is if you change your mind in the start of a project, it's a dollar. That same change, 70% of the way through the project will cost 60, no, will cost $100. So we stand you up against a wall. 
And we grabbed it, we walked. Say, tell us everything you want in this release. Everything. Because it's going to make you really incredibly pained if you change your mind. So you go home, you know, you talk to your friends, you talk to your cat, you, you think of everything you could possibly think of, and you put it in a PRD. It doesn't matter that it's not very useful. You just know that if you don't put it, it's going to be horribly painful. So we've trained you to spit it all out. Thank you. <laughs> so, so one, he's given us tons of stuff to do that doesn't have much marketplace value because we told him, tell us everything. The second thing is we've made you fearful of changing your mind. Right? Now, if we let you have, instead of a, a PRD, we give you a list of things that you want in the release, and we just say, just list it. You know, like use cases or user stories or things with some details, but prioritize it. Prioritize it so the things that you really want are at the top, the things you could care less about are at the bottom. And this can be as long a list as you want. And what we're going to let you do then is if this is your date, based on our velocity, you can choose what stuff will be in the release since we're delivering it increment by increment by increment. You can select and add it up piece by piece by piece so you get the highest value stuff. And you can change this. You can put new things in, remove old things. This is a, your shopping list. We are just engineers that will build this. So analogy is we're like a Ferrari. You're the driver. You can get in us and drive us over a cliff. Not good. Into a cliff, even worse. In circles, kind of dumb. To a place where everyone is enjoying where they are and it's a good thing to do. That's a good product manager. So we give them the responsibility of driving us sprint by sprint by sprint to something that gives the highest value. Um, if we were able to, and there are statistical techniques for doing this, to evaluate this this list of things that are now in the PRD. And we'd say, well, this one has a marketplace impact of $72 million. This one has a marketplace impact of $1,400. This one has a marketplace of $1. As we start building these, and you build a graph of cumulative value delivered by the teams, does that make sense? You'll see a chart like this where you build infrastructure architecture up front, and then this is value delivered, this is time. You start delivering all the very valuable things up front, and then at some point you start delivering things which aren't worth spending the money on. And the thing we train product managers on is when you get to this point, stop. They're used to standing back. This says you're in a car, drive it inch by inch by inch by inch. And that's a real change then. So we say change your mind. Don't, by the way, in, in lean manufacturing, lean thinking, inventory is a liability, not an asset. So this list of things that they want us to do, if they spend a lot of time thinking it through, the way you can think it through is called analysis, right? And then they document it they have sunk a huge amount of money into that PRD. And then if we say, let's not build some of it, that's waste. So we decompose this list of work to be done, which used to be a PRD. Top 20% has a lot of thought put into it. The next 20% has less thought into it. Bottom 60% are, are one-offs that we don't even think through in detail until and unless it bubbles up to be likely to be done. Thank you. <laughs> yes? Um, does anyone give any insight into uh, how to actually build architecture and design for, say, the items which aren't right at the top of the priorities? Architecture and design for the top priorities. Pardon? So I was wondering whether it helps you uh, to know how far down your priority is to design for. Because you don't, I'm feeling that you only design for the top couple of items. Then potentially you reach a point where the next couple of items are very expensive. Yeah, one of the questions has been um, about all agile is 
where do you do architecture infrastructure? And we drive architecture and infrastructure with non-functional requirements. So for instance, if it, this has to support five million simultaneous customers in a secure environment, that's a very high priority non-functional item. So that will probably be worked on to some extent in the first sprint, in the second sprint, in the third sprint. However, there's a rule in Scrum which, you is, which is you have to deliver a piece of business functionality, something the customers can use every sprint. So this means you might deliver a layer of the architecture and infrastructure in the first sprint with one piece driven down into detail working and demonstrable. The reason we do that is one, it may, keeps the customer engaged and secondly, it proves that the architecture and infrastructure you're devising works. As a profession, we are able to think with no impact for long periods of time and this causes us to bring it to um, a conclusion every month. So if I'm looking at a, a, a chart again on the amount of time spent in an architecturally intensive piece of work, this is work, this is time. The amount of time spent on architecture infrastructure will go like this. The amount of time spent on business functionality will go like that. But every sprint will deliver a piece of business functionality that demonstrates that architecture and infrastructure working. Yes? All over the place. Um, some are really good, some aren't. Some are great engineers, some are good QA people, some are good product management people. It's more um, a determination that they will do whatever is needed to help the team deliver the top quality software that meets the customer's needs every sprint. And that anything else is an impediment um, and they'll remove it. Now one of the rules we have started implementing lately is a dead scrum master is a useless scrum master. So going up against an organization for no purpose is useless. And, and I was kind of facetious, but not really. QA is a great source of them. Yes. Uh, a lot of companies now have uh, R&D center in different geographic location, and not all the location have the, all the functionality. So for some remote location, some uh, location have only limited amount of uh, different kind of functionality. How could they participate in this kind of environment? Do they need to be all the member of the scrum have to be in the same place? No. It, it's, questions can be how do we optimize and how do we cope? We've worked with teams that range from Lithuania through Helsinki all the way into China, one team, and it's horrible. But the domain knowledge is necessary so they work together. And they work together, I mean, when they are at work they do tricks like leaving a VoIP enabled intercom active amongst all the people so they can easily talk. The, the clear two key answers always are they have to be working in the same development environment and at the start of every release they have to be brought together for at least a month to two so they can talk things through and figure out how they're going to do it before they parse back to their homes. Otherwise you know, it's, it's not even worthwhile pursuing. One last question. So I was, uh, I, was, I was at a company once and tried to implement Scrum. Nobody there had any experience with it, so they were showing the book and then they added the company's own. Yeah. So it sort of blew up. You know, people left the company and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that, what do you recommend as the best way for a new to get started on Scrum? Try it in a project, try it with 18, try it with a release. See what works. Make sure that you know that the problems that emerge are usually have nothing to do with Scrum. It causes problems that were already existing there to become obvious. And the question then is, do you want to fix them or do you want to hobble along with those problems? Almost every organization that has stopped using Scrum, it's because it's unearthed 
either some cultural problem, an unwillingness for management to stop telling the engineers how to do their work, um, an unwillingness of developers to work together cross-functionally. It's an, an inability of the engineers to actually pull stuff together every iteration, an unwillingness to improve their engineering practices to do so. Scrum is like a, the canary in the coal mine. It's a test of whether it's a competent engineering organization. It may not be at the start, and it'll give you all the things you need to do to get to it, but that work of getting to it is that organization's. That's their work. And the question is whether software is important to them and whether they're competent enough in their profession to do it. It's, it's really hard. Thank you very much.